Hello everyone, welcome back to this series on general relativity. In the last video we derived the Schwarzschild metric. In this video we look at one specific consequence of this metric, the precession of the perihelion of the planet Mercury. Recall from Newtonian mechanics that if a particle of mass m is moving in a central potential that is proportional to the inverse radial distance, then the particle's trajectory must be an ellipse. The distance between the particle and the focal point of the ellipse will oscillate between the aphelion, the farthest distance, and the perihelion, the shortest distance. According to Newton's theory of gravitation, this situation should continue forever, barring, of course, the effects of the other planets. However, in 1859, a French mathematician, Urbain Laverrier, discovered that the axis of the ellipse shifts or precesses at the rate of about 38 arc seconds per Earth century. Here is a highly exaggerated version of this phenomenon. Despite several attempts at an explanation, the problem remained unsolved until Einstein's general relativity. At the time, Einstein didn't have the benefit of the Schwarzschild solution and had to solve the problem using perturbation methods. We, however, are more privileged. Having the Schwarzschild metric at our disposal, we can reformulate the problem to make it look exactly like that of a particle moving in an effective central potential. The trajectories of particles moving in a curved spacetime are given by the geodesic equation, where the Christoffel symbols were worked out in a previous video. The functions a and b were found to be this, where rc is the critical radius, which will be discussed in a later video on black holes. It is called critical because b is singular when r equals rc. However, rc is usually very small. In fact, for our Sun it is only about 3 kilometers. Since we are talking about planetary orbits here, rc will always be orders of magnitude smaller than the typical radial distance, so we won't have to worry about b becoming singular. We begin by solving the geodesic equation for theta, t and phi. The reason for doing it in this specific order will soon become clear. The solutions to these equations was a mystery for a long time. Fortunately, after much finessing from physicists, nature decided to declassify this highly sensitive information. Plugging in the expressions for the Christoffel symbols, we get an equation for theta that looks like this. Notice that every term in this equation has a factor of at least one derivative of theta, which means that d theta ds equals to zero is a solution. It also means that theta must be a constant, which we will choose to be pi over 2 for convenience. What this says is that the orbital plane does not change with time. This is true in Newton's gravity and it is true here as well. Next, the equation for t takes on this form. In terms of t dot, it can be written like this, which is merely the derivative of a logarithm. This equation says that t dot a is a constant. We'll call it a capital E. Moving on to the equation for phi. It too can be written in a logarithmic form, leading to another constant of motion, phi dot r squared, which we'll call capital L. Instead of solving the geodesic equation for r, which has in it a second derivative of r, let's write down the spacetime distance, which has only the first derivative of r. Dividing both sides by ds squared and replacing the two constants of motion with e and l, we arrive at a very simple relation for r and r dot, which we can simplify still further by multiplying both sides by a. What we end up with is an energy equation for a particle of unit mass and an effective potential v. The first two terms in this expression comprise the Newton's gravitational effective potential. The last term is a correction due to general relativity. It is rather remarkable that these two radically different theories differ by merely one term. However, this term can cause the trajectories to diverge significantly from those stipulated by Newton's theory of gravity. For the orbit of Mercury, however, this term will be very small, which will allow us to use perturbation theory to calculate corrections to the perfectly elliptical Newtonian orbits. So, in the end, we end up using perturbation methods just as Einstein did. But unlike Einstein, we have a much clearer picture of the problem and can relate it to the celestial mechanics of Newton. Okay, here's what we've got so far. 
Instead of solving all three equations in terms of the proper time, let's solve for r as a function of phi. We can do this by applying this relation and replacing phi dot with L over r squared. Plugging this into the original equation, we get the following. We can clean it up a little by multiplying both sides by 2r squared over L squared. To make the equation even nicer, let's define a new variable, u. The ratio of r prime to r will be preserved under the variable change up to a minus sign. Now, let's plug it back into the original equation and multiply by u squared. And this is the result. Lastly, let's differentiate both sides of the equation and multiply it by 2u prime. The outcome is this nice looking equation. The first three terms correspond to the problem of orbital motion governed by Newton's gravitation, the solution of which is this, where e is the eccentricity of the orbit. If you solve this equation for r, you will end up with the expression for an ellipse. If alpha is small, we can use perturbation theory to find corrections to u0. By matching the powers of alpha, we end up with infinitely many coupled equations. Here's just the first two. Let's have a look at the first one. Plugging in the solution of u0 and bringing it to the right hand side yields this. We can use some trigonometric identities to get rid of the square over the cosine. There. Let us call this equation star. Problem of this type has been solved and can be found in any classical mechanics book, so I will not go on about it here. I will simply give you the solution. Here it is. If we plug it back into star and match all the terms, we find a and b. So finally, up to the first order on alpha, the solution of u, or the inverse of r, is this. We can use the smallness of alpha again to cast this expression into a form that is easier to interpret. For the orbit of Mercury, alpha is indeed very small, only about 10 to the minus 7. In order for the cosine function to return to its initial value, phi must reach not 360 degrees, but 360 divided by 1 minus alpha, which to the first order on alpha gives a correction of about 43 arc seconds per Earth century. So there it is, a prediction of general relativity. There are two more predictions that have been made by Einstein in the early days of his theory, and they too have been tested and confirmed. One is the deflection of light as it passes near a star, and the other is the gravitational redshift of a light beam as it travels away from a massive object. Fun fact, when Einstein was asked what his reaction would have been had the deflection test failed, his answer was, then I would feel sorry for the dear lord, the theory is correct anyway. And that concludes this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, cheers.